And last but not least, our final speaker for this session, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Adrian Newman to Creedy, who is based in France and has a very esteemed career working for 30 years, really looking at serotonin, but is here this morning to talk about a new exploratory study, phase two, proof of concept, looking at MLX112. Welcome. Thank you, Emily, and uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here at WPC in Barcelona, um, particularly as I am uh, able to present some uh, intriguing and in exciting, we think, data on a clinical trial which just completed um, very recently, and this is the first disclosure um, of these results here at this meeting. Um, so this is my disclosure. And the story starts with the search for solutions to treat uh, dyskinesia. When I say it starts with that, it's because the story gets broader than that, and I'm going to explain why in just a minute. But uh, I think we're all aware that um, levodopa-induced dyskinesia is an issue for people with Parkinson's. It affects a lot of people. And it's not uh, something which is particularly well managed at the moment. Um, it can lead to um, suboptimal dosing of levodopa. Uh, amantadine is not uh, the best treatment. And, uh, of course, surgery is complicated. But um, it does raise... Um, a discussion about serotonin because there's an emerging story about the role of serotonin um, in dyskinesia and particularly serotonin 5-HT1A receptors. So 5-HT is 5-hydroxytryptamine. Um, serotonin neurons can take up levodopa and release it as dopamine, and we call this a false neurotransmitter effect, and that triggers a dyskinesia. So if you target 5-HT1A receptors, uh, that is a promising mechanism to reduce the dyskinesia. Um, people have tried this, but the drugs have been uh, essentially non-selective. Um, if you look at the buspirone uh, profile here, you can see that as well as hitting 5-HT1A receptors, it also hits various other receptors, whereas this new drug, NLX112, is exceptionally selective, and that really is a distinguishing feature. And the other thing is that um, this new compound fully activates the target 5-HT1A receptors, where those previous serotonin drugs only partially effect, activate the target. Uh, so we uh, took um, uh, NLX112 through a whole series of studies in rat, marmoset, macaque, and now in this clinical trial, uh, which was a randomized double-blind trial. It was an eight-week study, five sites in Sweden. Primary outcome was safety and tolerability, and we looked at uh, efficacy on uh, dyskinesia and also on Parkinsonism. And we had an up titration only in two weeks. It was very brief just a couple of weeks of steady state at the maximum dose, and then a down titration, and three office visits where the patients received a nail dopa challenge, and they were observed to see their Parkinson's symptoms. It was the balanced population between uh, the NLX group and the placebo, um, 65 years of old, age on average, um, male-female balance. Uh, just to say, all the patients had fairly um, extensive periods since diagnosis and somewhat advanced uh, H&Y scores. So uh, screen 35, randomized 27, and we completed at the end with 15 and 7 in the two groups. Um, so first parameter which we're interested in was uh, safety and tolerability. There were no safety alerts. That was very important. Just to mention that NLX12 has been uh, tested previously in other clinical trials in um, over 600 subjects for other indications. And so we have already an extensive safety database. Uh, so that was very reassuring. And here you can see that the a number of adverse events was essentially similar between the drug and placebo groups. And uh, all the uh, AEs, all the adverse events, were mild and moderate. There was one severe adverse event, but it turned out to be in the placebo group. There were no serious adverse events in the drug group. And if you look at the kinds of adverse events observed, um, the one that really came out was nausea, a bit of nausea in the drug group. Uh, otherwise, there was nothing of very great uh, concern. So that was really uh, good news for us right away. Um, these, this profile was very consistent with what we've seen previously. Now, in terms of efficacy readouts, of course, we were looking at LID. 
So levodopa produced its Ganesia. And this was the uh, change from baseline in the UDIS, so the, the unified Ganesia rating scale score. Uh, and we saw a significant decrease in the LID scores in the NLX group and very little, not significant effect in the placebo group. Um, the, the difference in the scores was about four points, which is uh, um, sort of encouraging. And uh, that's similar to what you see if you just focus on parts three and four of the UDIS RS, which is the um, uh, part of the scale which focuses specifically on objective disability. That's what the clinicians rate when the patients come in and have their challenge. And you can see there was no uh, effect of placebo and a clear effect of the drug. Now, just to say that that effect size um, increased by between the end of the titration period and after the two-week steady state. So even in what is really quite a very compact trial, only a small number of patients, and even quite a brief um, duration, we saw uh, a noticeable increase in the effect size. And of course, we're wondering what would happen if we carried on longer periods. Uh, and just to say that that effect size is not dissimilar to what you might expect with a reference drug, which is amantadine, uh, which has been reported in previous trials uh, with uh, relatively short trials as well. So, so this is very encouraging as an anti-discanetic effect. Uh, but we're also interested in what happens on the Parkinsonism uh, scores. And the, the scale that is used there is the UPDRS, Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale. And here as well, we saw that there was a significant decrease in the UPDRS scores uh, with this compound. Um, the placebo group was quite variable, but not significant. But if we focus more specifically on the part three, which is the motor disability part, um, no effect of placebo at all, and a clear uh, decrease in UPDRS scores in the NLX112 group. Um, now, this is really, uh, we think, uh, quite striking because um, uh, these kinds of decreases are on top of uh, the challenge that the patients have received with L-DOPA. So the patients have come into the clinic, they've taken a, a kind of a booster dose of L-DOPA, so they are loaded with, uh, with dopamine. And yet, despite having this dopamine boost, we're still seeing an additional anti-Parkinsonian effect of this, of this uh, drug on top of what they've already got. So this is something which is different from a dopamine mechanism. And just to remind you, NLX112 is not a dopaminergic drug. It's a very, very selective serotonin activator, serotonin agonist. So this is doing something different. It's going through a different mechanism. And uh, if you look at um, the effect size, um, in that uh, part three, uh, well, it's not dissimilar to what has been reported in other trials uh, with dopamine agonists, uh, such as reticotine, promopexol, or apinerol. Uh, so we're in the same kind of range. So what we're seeing here, uh, I think, is a very interesting uh, first indication that if you go into um, people with Parkinson's uh, with a selective activator of these serotonin 5 one receptors, you can achieve two things. You can take down their dyskinesias, and you can also take down their Parkinsonism. Uh, now, I was speaking to somebody yesterday uh, who said, oh, that sounds like a concertina effect. And, and what he meant was, you're squeezing the problem from both ends. Uh, you're squeezing the uh, Discanesia from one end, which is resulting from this excessive dopamine surge, and you're squeezing the problem from the other end because maybe, maybe we can reduce or delay the need for L-DOPA treatment by something like this compound, which has this anti-Parkinsonian effect. Just to add that um, if you look at the CGI, so that's the clinical uh, general impression of change, uh, over half of the patients showed a, an improvement, whereas in the placebo group, only just over a quarter uh, did so. So again, the needle is moving in the right direction. Um, 
So just to summarize these uh, findings, uh, the primary outcome was successful. This was really important and very reassuring. It was favorable at safety and tolerability. The secondary outcome was also successful. There was a reduction in PDLID. Uh, and we also had this additional efficacy against the Parkinsonian symptoms. Uh, we're now wondering, do we have a, a, a dual anti-dyskinetic and anti-Parkinsonian drug candidate with a new mechanism action, which is serotonergic instead of dopaminergic. What are the next steps? Well, we're obviously preparing for uh, a phase 2b uh, study. We're looking at the uh, design. Three things we want to do. Uh, firstly, we want, obviously, to have a much larger number of participants. Uh, secondly, we're looking at higher doses. Given that the drug is well tolerated and safe, you know, we think we have margin to, to go up higher and hopefully achieve a much um, even larger uh, beneficial effect size. And obviously, longer treatment duration. We only had two weeks at the steady state. We want to go to four, six, or eight weeks. Um, so uh, with that, I just want to acknowledge uh, all the participants in this trial. Um, uh, pa Odin, uh, who is one of the clinical investigators, is here in the audience and um, uh, with the other uh, investigators in Sweden. Uh, and also to acknowledge very strongly uh, Parkinson's UK, the virtual biotech, and Michael J. Fox Foundation that financed this trial. And just to say that the, the poster, there's a hot topic poster, which is still up in the poster area. I will be there after this session with Pa Rodin, so feel free to come and, <clears throat> come and talk to me about this. I think we think it's very interesting. Thank you for your attention. Adrian, thank you so much. Really exciting findings, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. So we'll, we'll start with the person at the back in the white. Yes, hello, I'm Marie Futsadi from France Parkinson, the Patient Association. I was wondering if you did any gender analysis. You know, we talk about a lot of gender. As you clinical trial is balanced, uh, women and men, but have you done any post hoc analysis to see if there's actually a gender difference and how are the women in your trial more premenopause, postmenopause, perimenopause? Any analysis on that? If not, you should plan it on the next one. <laughs> so, yes. Possibly a question, possibly some advice, Adrian, but do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, message received. So, um, the, um, at this level, the trial is obviously a small trial. We only had uh, 15 and 7, as, as you saw. Uh, there was balance in gender in this trial, but uh, uh, that's as far as you can go in saying anything at this stage. But uh, certainly, in larger trials, that becomes a, a real question. So, yes, absolutely. Adrian, I wonder, you, you saw an um, improvement in subjective change in the placebo and the active group. Did you assess the integrity of the blinding at any juncture? That would be one aspect. And the other would be whether you enrolled people who were already on amantadine in the trial? Yes. So, um, so there were two questions there. So for the blinding, we did wonder whether the side effects of serotonin activation might unblind unwittingly the trial. Now, in fact, uh, they didn't because uh, there was such little difference between the two groups in terms of the side effects that, uh, um, in fact, we were trying to guess in advance who was on which drug and we totally didn't get it. Right. Okay, so, so that, that was okay. Uh, and the other question was about amantadine. So th that's interesting because, of course, so many patients suffering from dyskinesia uh, are treated with uh, amantadine and in this trial there were uh, half a dozen patients who continued taking amantadine throughout. And of course, they were in the trial because the amantadine wasn't effective. Uh, so they had breakthrough dyskinesia despite their amantadine. Um, and in fact, five of them were in the NLX group and responded to NLX. So we, we think we can do something with this serotonin agonist that you can't do with, uh, with amantadine. Thank you very much. We've got one further question here at the front. Yeah, don't worry, I'm not going to ask about gender. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually young onset Parkinson's. So I know like a lot of my uh, peers, you know, we all suffer from uh, varying levels of dyskinesia. And I notice obviously your age range is, is on the older side. Would you consider doing a, a sort of um, a sort of separate um, within your larger study looking at young onset versus older onset? Now, that's interesting because um, I think younger onset patients uh, do often experience much more severe dyskinesia. And so, uh, so, so that could be 
uh, a real interesting cohort within a larger study uh, to look at those, uh, uh, those patients. So, so, so the answer is yes, there would definitely be of interest. Um, interest therapeutically, but also interest mechanistically to see if they respond more favorably to a new mechanism. Because again, th this is not dopamine we're talking about, okay? So this, this is a serotonin mechanism. So we're looking at another way of attacking the problem. And, and I think we've got a lot to learn uh, in different patient populations, such as young onset. I suppose just in terms of the, the women as well um, tend to suffer more from anxiety and depression. So I wonder in terms of the serotonin, again, looking at that side would be really interesting. But I, I think, I'm, I'm, I must say, I'm really excited and there's lots of young onset people who would be happy, I'd say, to take part yes. in the study. So. Thank you. Uh, so uh, you raise a really good point, and maybe if I can just comment on that. Um, you're probably familiar that, of course, serotonin mechanisms are very associated with mood control, mood and cognition. Um, so one of the things we've been looking at, and I, I didn't show it here, but um, uh, we've been looking at the activity of this of this drug candidate on models of, of pain, of non-motor symptoms, of depression, and it, in animal models, so in, we're talking rat tests, it is effective. So one thing that would be very interesting to do in, in future trials, larger trials, is actually to look at those non-motor symptoms, particularly uh, anxiety and depression scales, uh, to see if there's also um, a beneficial effect on non-motor uh, readouts. Adrian, thank you very much. I'm sorry we don't have any further time for questions this morning because we're moving on to the award ceremony, but please join me in thanking Adrian.